And now, the 1950s. But the beatniks, though. Yes, I know, the beatniks were in the 1950s, but we've already talked about them, right? I also know that uh, we've already talked about the Cold War, and the 1950s were in the Cold War, and in fact, the Cold War took place throughout all of the 1950s and beyond. Well, that's true, but uh, I wanted to uh, switch over to a different category uh, nonetheless. So we're going to be focusing on, well, really, again, culture and events of the 1950s. Uh, so we're going to be in the same general time period that we've, we've been talking about. The more than a quarter of a century after World War II, 1946 to 1973, sometimes is referred to by historians as the, quote, golden age of capitalism, end quote, or by your grandpa as the good old days. Okay, so this was a, uh, an unprecedented time of economic expansion when prices were stable, unemployment was low, and the economy just seemed to keep getting better and better. Not like the 1920s when the economy just kind of skyrocketed for some people and didn't really move for others, setting up a big fall, but just kind of a consistent, gradual growth of the economy and of wages and of standards of living. In addition, there were more modern conveniences being, uh, being introduced. We'll talk about those. And the middle class grew much larger than it had ever been. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there were uh, fewer rich people. It meant there were fewer poor people. More people were moving up to the middle. Now, this, of course, takes place during the Cold War. And that may have been a, at least one factor, although there are other factors we're definitely going to be talking about. It wasn't the biggest factor, but at least a small factor was the fact that this Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union that didn't erupt into a hot war, but could have at any time, meant more money being spent on defense consistently, right? So part of what pulled America out of the Depression was World War II and that sudden huge increase in defense spending. It went down when the war was over, but not as much as it had in past wars because there's still kind of a standing alert, right? That became kind of the status quo. It just became, became normal. Uh, more money was being put into the military, which means more money is being put into manufacturing things for the military, more military bases are being built. There were also some, some rapid and profound changes in the way people worked, in the world of work. Now, part of that is due to the fact that factory jobs and farm jobs gradually declined over the years, and what is known as the service sector grew. Uh, the service sector, that's a uh, that's where you, you, you're working. You're not working for the, the government. Uh, you're not working in manufacturing and you're not working in agriculture. You're serving people in some way. Now, that could be anything from um, being a house painter to uh, stocking shelves at, at a grocery store. For the first time in 1956, uh, for the very first time, there were more white-collar workers in America than there were blue-collar workers. Now, you probably heard those expressions before, and you probably know what they mean and, and where they got that name. But just in case you didn't, I put these pictures up because during that time period, I'm not so sure if this is still true. It was true when I was growing up in the 70s and into the 80s. Um, men who worked uh, in factories... Uh, and at service stations and things like that, usually wore denim work shirts that were more durable, right? That could stand up to more wear and tear, whereas people working in offices wore dress shirts. So literally, 
Some people had blue collars and some people had white collars, and you could tell what kind of job they had by what kind of collar they were wearing. There was also rapid growth in the number of homes in suburban areas, or the suburbs, which really was practically a brand new thing at the end of World War II, because before the war, you lived either you lived either in town or you lived in the country. You left town and then you were in the country. Suburbs, suburban areas, are outside of town, but they're not quite country. Uh, and you can see all these houses that were that were built. <clears throat> many of them built uh, pretty quickly, beginning with the uh, end of the war, because all those all those GIs were coming home from the war. Uh, many of them were going to college on the GI Bill and were able to get better jobs and there were more jobs available. So uh, between the end of the war and uh, 10 years later, by the mid-1950s, the number of actual houses in the United States had doubled. Uh, and by 1960, uh, there were more people living in the suburbs than were living in rural areas. Today, there are more people living in suburbs than rural areas and large cities combined. So then by the 1970s, 1980s, living in the suburbs, living in uh, what were called sometimes subdivisions, had really become the American norm when before the end of World War II, there hadn't even been such a thing. And in the 1950s, there was a proliferation of modern conveniences to make life, well, more convenient. Uh, we'll start with a very basic one that I bet you've never thought about being a modern convenience, concentrated orange juice, which was introduced uh, as uh, uh, the Donald Duck brand uh, that was licensed from Disney. What is concentrated orange juice? Well, that's when you buy these little cans, you know, at the grocery store and it's frozen and you kind of squeeze the can and it all glops out and then you add water and stir it all around and you've got orange juice, right? Um, before that, before that, if people wanted orange juice, you had to get a sack of oranges and get an orange uh, juicer, which is just like a uh, this thing that you held in your hand that you squeeze the oranges over uh, and manually squeeze all the juice out of them, which took a long time. So orange juice was kind of a luxury, really. Um, you had to have uh, a lot of time to prepare it. Now, all of a sudden, you can just buy it, you know, frozen and make your own. Of course, later, they also, you know, uh, as as you can do now, would just have ready-made orange juice. But concentrated was was the first thing. Now, the next thing that uh, let's talk about is over there on the upper right, the refrigerator, which was uh, also a new thing because what most people had was called an ice box, and it looked a lot like a refrigerator. You know, it had that same, you know, you, you pull it open, uh, except it didn't have any electricity, and it didn't have any, uh, any freezing to it. That's what made this new thing called a refrigerator work, right? Freon, uh, that kept things cold. So what you had to do before that, there was a guy called the Iceman. There were people who had that as a full-time job. And he would come through your neighborhood and deliver great big, huge blocks of ice, like half the size of that ice box. And he'd have big tongs and he'd bring it in and set it in your ice box and you'd set all the food around it and the ice would keep it cold while the ice slowly melted. Then you'd have to get some more. Well, now, bang, you just plug this thing up and it works. It's a place you can keep your concentrated orange juice. Now, another big thing was television. Now, television, you could argue, had been invented in the 1930s, but it was just kind of, uh, you know, uh, something that was displayed at the World's Fair, like this freaky futuristic thing. It wasn't until after World War II that televisions started to be uh, 
manufactured in large numbers and affordable enough that people could buy them and they became more affordable as time went on. Uh, and a lot of radio stations started either switching over to television or also including television. Uh, by 1947, 1948, there were several regular, regular uh, television programs being, being broadcast, only in black and white. That's all they had at that time. And in the first few years, everybody couldn't afford one. Um, like I said, the price gradually went down. So in the early 50s, you might, uh, you might have one person in your neighborhood that has a TV and everyone just shows up at their house in the evening, kind of like radio when it first, uh, first came out in the early 1920s. Well, another thing about television is it was broadcast television. Uh, there was no way to record what came on. So if you had a favorite show, it came on at a certain time, and you had to sit there and watch it or you'd miss it. In fact, you get up and, you know, go get your dinner or, or uh, go to the bathroom or whatever. You're going to miss something. Um, you wait for the commercials, usually, because that's the way these stations paid for this stuff. And uh, this led to the advent of the TV dinner, right? You just pop it in the oven, not in the microwave. There wouldn't be microwaves in, you know, for about 20 more years. So you pop it in the oven for... 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or whatever, comes out hot and ready to eat. And you might even invest in a TV tray, right? So you set this thing up. It's something you can put that hot TV dinner in while you watch Milton Berle or the Jack Benny program or whatever it is that you're watching. Uh, the social life of the family started to center around the television set in the living room. And really, it was unheard of to have television sets, uh, to have more than one in a house that would just be, you know, like the height of extravagant uh, wealth to do that. Now, another thing that happened is the, the return of automobile culture, which we talked about after we talked about World War I, you know, right after the war, cars had become affordable, people started taking Sunday drives and so forth. That all kind of got curtailed when the Great Depression came along because gas costs money and most people didn't have much. Uh, then World War II came along and uh, even if you had the money to buy gas, gas was being rationed by the government. So there'd be enough gasoline for the military to use. Then the war is over and all of a sudden you can buy all the gas that you want if you can afford it. And it was pretty cheap. So you started having things like drive-in services uh, that includes, like there in the middle, drive-in movies, which became a thing in the late 1940s and were very popular in the 1950s. Um, you don't see very many uh, anymore. There's a handful around. There's, uh, there's one in Sparta. Uh, it actually uh, closed down in the mid-80s and reopened about 20 years later, and it's still going now. Also, drive-in services at fast food restaurants, hamburger places. Uh, where you could just drive in uh, and be waited on uh, by people who would run out, take your order. You never got out of the car. Also, motels. And I talked about motels in the context of the 1920s. The first use of the term motel was in 1925. Motor hotels that were there along the highways now that people had cars and they had gasoline and they could take longer trips. It wasn't until post-World War II that motel as a term caught on with the American public and became a synonym for all these. It was a brand name for a certain chain back in the 1920s. So these are all small things seemingly on the surface, but they led to some really large cultural changes pretty quickly. If the United States had become a consumer culture at the end of World War I, at the end of World War II, they had graduated to a full-fledged consumerist culture. And just like in the uh, 1920s after the First World War, the economy was fueled by rising debt and, well, increasing encouragement from 
uh, companies uh, producing goods and advertising companies hired by them to encourage people to consume ever more. And in fact, it reached the, reached the point that consumerism was used as an argument for capitalism. So that, uh, you know, when we talked about the Marshall Plan and uh, the, the fact that the U.S. was spending money to help rebuild countries in Europe to prevent them from being tempted to join the communist bloc, well, uh, kind of in the same way here, uh, even the, uh, the consumer society and even all these modern conveniences were presented as evidence. Capitalism is the better way to go because you will have leisure time and life will be more convenient. We're talking about things like uh, automatic dishwashers, washing machines, vacuum cleaners, all relatively new things in the 1950s. In fact, um, there was a display at a museum of just the typical American suburban middle-class kitchen with all the trimmings that was, uh, that was used when the uh, leader of the Soviet Union visited in the 1950s. And the vice president took him on a tour and he made sure that he took him to that museum and showed off all the modern conveniences as a way to to demonstrate the superiority of capitalism and consumerism. 